Hello, friends. This is Mike Williams. Today, Steve Farber and John Lennox return to the show for part three of the team's research into the standing stone located on Billy's farm. And so without further ado, here's the show with Steve and John. Okay, folks, we have uh, another great show. Steve Farber is back with John Lennox. Ralph couldn't make it, unfortunately, but we're going to have a shot at part three of the Standing Stone. Steve and John have some more information they want to take us through. There, there are some more clues, and I think you're really going to enjoy this presentation. So we're going to title the presentation, Looking Through the Bent Back Tulips, Paul McCartney's Final Resting Spot, Part 3. So, Steve, I guess what we should do is um, let's go to the second slide up to High Park Farm again, and then you have some drone footage. Why don't you give us some background as to what it is that you were looking to do this time around with the drone? Hey, Mike, glad to be back. And uh, this time we were we were trying to go up and search. Uh, John and his wife um, were trying to go up and search down the area of the tulips that we had in previous videos. Especially in the last one, I think we showed uh, showed uh, Billy and his family doing a planting in a rectangular area down near a burn um, near the standing stone, and they were planting some kind of bulbs in there. So this was the time that tulips come up, and they would have definitely been up, but we couldn't get the drone in far enough because there's a new lock on the gate. So that was a little bit of a bummer, but we were able to get a drone in partway. So at least you can see how desolate the land is there. Okay, so we will get to the um, the chart with the lock on the gate. This is very interesting. We'll talk about that because uh, obviously for that to have been done, it means that Billy is aware of the work that you've been doing and the presentations. So, and I know, like I said, we'll talk about that some more, especially with regard to one of the songs that's on his McCartney 3 album. So the next slide you have here says, what will our foxes find? And Steve, just remind the audience about what the fox is, what you believe it means within the context of Billy. Um, well, Ralph Pacheco put all this graphics together. He did a great job on this and uh, actually shows Crowley in the background there because we still think possibly it's uh, Bill's father. We don't know. Yeah. Um, but Two Young Foxes was in the song When Winter Comes. Like you said, on McCartney 3 album, it was one of my favorite songs on there, not just because of that, but I just thought it was a nice, uh, simple song, acoustic guitar, not too much in it. But there was a thing about the foxes, and I thought the mending a gate part and all that, you know, it meant about John and his wife going in there, and they got to fix the fence, you know, put some kind of lock on it, which is uh, apparently what they did. And as John could tell you, that was uh, wide open before that gate was wide open, no lock. So they definitely don't want people in there now. Um, if he was able to get in there, he could have driven up a little further, I believe, to go through the tulips and the standing stone again, but he couldn't get it through that gate. Okay, and you have the song lyrics there. Must fix the fence by the acre plot. Two young foxes have been nosing around. And so it's, it's your thought that perhaps the two foxes are John and his wife. Yeah, that's what we thought, that it might have been added. I guess that song was written before that. And one of the people that helps inform me told me that that song was written earlier. I, you know, whether that part of the lyrics or not was in it, but it was written much earlier than when John and his wife went up to the farm. It seems like it could be a coincidence, but for me, that to be a coincidence, the way it's in that verbiage, I, I think not. Yeah, and whenever they say a song was written back when, that doesn't mean that's when the song was completed. So the music may have been written or, um, you know, he had the melody and then he reworked the lyrics. I'm saying he being Billy reworked the lyrics to be able to tell this particular story. So people have to be careful whenever they hear or read that, hey, that song was written back 10 years ago or whatever. Yes, that could very well have been and it was pulled off the shelf. But that does not mean that that's when the song was completed, meaning the final lyrics, the final music and all that so yeah. but i do find it to be quite a coincidence because um we're going to get into it a little later you also have some some screen captures from one of billy's videos yes yep yeah, that's correct you were contacted by tom and it appears that your work might wind up in one of the footnotes in the new update to memoirs which is coming out in october 
Yes, it, it will uh, be in the new box set of memoirs, you know, where they have the lyrics books and that set, you know, where you can order it on that memoirs at Paul dot com. So it's going to be in in the upcoming uh, edition of memoirs, which is pretty cool. I can't say much more about it, but it's definitely has something about the standing stone. In it. Two things. One, they put a lock on the gate, which means Billy and whoever's watching on Billy's behalf is perfectly aware of the work that you're doing and the investigation into the Standing Stone. And then if you end up in the box set that's coming out in October, I mean, that's that's good stuff. <laughs> you know, it, it means that people are listening and watching. And uh, I would think that it means that your work has credibility. Okay, so very interesting. We'll, we'll look forward to uh, reading the footnote when we get into October and uh, the box set starts to ship. And the next slide, that's the gate. So, John, when you went in this gate the first time, did you go straight or did you make a left? How did you get to the farm? Uh, we just we stumbled upon it accidentally. We were driving up a little back road and you could see it from the side of the road. Uh, and we just turned up that, that wee, it's like a, a, log, a logged road, see, like a where they cut down trees. It seems to be like that. It's a, a very rough road. And we just turned up there and drove and we were literally a couple of miles from the farm at that point when we got out and walked across. Okay, so the road that you were driving on, is that the road here we're seeing? Yes. When you got there, John, were you surprised that the gate was locked? Uh, yeah, I think I was because the last time it was wide open. There wasn't a, a lock anywhere to be seen. And it was a, a combination lock. So I tried all the obvious numbers like nine, 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 six, 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 and all that, but none that worked. Okay, <laughs> very good. You probably should have tried his birthday. <laughs> um, and then the next slide in, we have, uh, these are stills I think you took from the first visit, yes? Ah, that's right, they're for last year. Okay, so folks, what we're seeing here on the left, that's Billy's farm. You can see the red doors. What are we looking at on the right here, this burn? That is the, the small, the, the I, can't, I can't remember the name of the burn. That's a small burn that runs around the back of the property. Uh, and that's just a couple of boulders that were sitting at the side of it. I think that's the same gate in the picture at the other side. In both pictures, it's the same gate. So the burn is, the stream is quite close to the farm. I see. All right, very good. You can see the standing stone in that uh, slide to the left. It's real thin up in the evergreens there. You can kind of see the outline. The upper it. left, yeah. I'll put a circle around it. Uh, let's uh, move to the next slide. And, and here we have, I've never seen this before, so I had no idea they had a statue of Linda McCartney holding a lamb. And so, Steve, what's significant about this uh, this particular image? When John couldn't get in the farm, figured, you know, try to go in town and interview some people like we had tried to do the last time. Nobody wanted to talk. There was one person. He had met uh, Jane Asher and Billy back in the day, but he wasn't willing to talk either. But this memorial, I guess, was planted when Linda died. And what I thought was interesting about it, in the foreground, you could see two very dark tulips. I think in the next slide, it shows a close up, at least one of the tulips. You know, here again, like I'm in that kind of business and uh, to just have two tulips planted, it's kind of a little bit bizarre. I, I would think that they would do a grouping of them, but like they did on some of the other flowers there. But to have two tulips that are dark like that, kind of a blood red, I thought, you know, maybe one is Bill and one is uh, Paul. And it's kind of some kind of symbolism there. Okay. And where exactly is, is this, the statue and these grounds? Where is this? Uh, John could answer that, I believe. It's in the, the, the Campbelltown, actual town itself. It's a memorial garden to Linda. Okay. Now, this is interesting to me because Steve was just saying that whenever you try to engage the locals to talk about the farm, they don't say anything. They clam up. None of them wanted to be on camera or recorded, but the, the one guy that we, we spoke to was an older fellow. He was an ex-policeman, and he had met Billy with Jane Asher, so... God knows how many times she was up there. It wasn't that much. He says he also used to see Linda on a daily basis in Campbelltown. So I think this is a very good example of people that in all likelihood know that Billy is not biological Paul McCartney, yet they won't talk about it. And as you guys know, I'm sure you get asked the same questions I get asked. People will ask, well, how come nobody steps out to talk about this, Mike? How come friends, family, people in the business and so on don't spill the beans? And here we have a situation in Campbelltown where the locals, they stay mum. And I have to think, given the fact that they have a memorial of Linda McCartney, 
that it's out of respect that Billy and Linda mean a lot to the town. So the good folks in Campbelltown are just not going to talk about it. And I'll bet that they're certainly not going to talk about it to somebody who is from out of town. That is completely off limits. So, John, what do you think? I think you're probably right. They, they just, I think they just don't want to speak because of how important they were to the town back in the day. And for the, the fact that people coming to the town to visit and things like that. But I just don't think... I think most of the people will know, especially the older ones, I think they will know, but they will not. They'll keep it in the town. They'll keep it amongst themselves. How big is Campbelltown? Is it is it a large town? No, it's pretty small. Okay, so that's that's what I thought. And so if you have a small town, they're also less apt to start talking because once somebody opens their mouth, it's going to become a problem, right? Because the rest of the population, the rest of the town is going to say, hey, what are you talking about that for? Ah, that's probably right. Yeah. They don't think the rest of the town would be too happy with them. And so we have the next slide and uh steve this is from the, the video we showed this i think in the first part and also in part two is there anything else you wanted to say about what's going on here um pretty much said it in the other video again it's it's an odd planting people just don't go in the middle of the field and plant a bunch of bulbs you know in a rectangular grave shape you know it's very odd and the burn you can see that i guess they call the streams in scotland burns and I believe it's called Punball Burn is how it's pronounced. And that, that seems to be right behind Billy there and Martha the dog. And that's where I was trying to get John to go see if we could get a rectangular planting come up in, in a video, you know, in a video or a photo. I'd love to fly a plane over the place and just take a aerial photo. It's probably too late now. Anyway, you know, this, this planting of the bulbs in that kind of a shape in the middle of a field just makes no sense at all. And I was hoping to capture tulips coming up there because I still believe they're tulips. And, you know, they could be other thing, crocuses, they could be daffodils, but I believe they're tulips because of the song. Okay. All right. Excellent. I've been asked a couple of times what my thoughts were about the band Famous Groupies. Now, some folks may not even know who the band is, but the thing about Famous Groupies is they play songs which are very, very McCartney sounding songs, especially songs during Billy's Wings days. And the vocals are uncanny. And so I've had a couple of email exchanges with Kirkaldi McKenzie. And Kirkaldi is uh, is a member of the band Famous Groupies. And he gave me the green light to use one of his songs in my Decoding McCartney 3 presentation. And Steve, he gave you the green light to use his song, Maggie's Farm, in this presentation, which we're going to play in a moment, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, probably when you're running the video, I believe you're going to probably have it up with that, the song. But yeah. if not, it's going to be somewhere in this uh, presentation. But I was really struck by this this song, you know, especially because I believe Kirkaldi has some tie-ins in with, uh, with Bill somehow, you know, and I, yeah. I can only speculate what it is, and I, I don't want to say anything. I do know some things, but I can't really say it. When people have asked me, I have said that uh, my feeling, and again, this is my feeling, I don't know anything for sure, but Famous Groupies is part of the disclosure process. And uh, I got a comment the other day on my YouTube channel, and somebody checked out memoirsofpaul.com and said, hey, you know, it's a very basic website. It looks like it's you know from the 1990s or whatever, and you know, why wouldn't Billy have a flashier website? And I responded back to this person, and explain that he likes to do things cryptically, doesn't want to create a lot of fanfare, a lot of splash. I mean, this is how Billy's operating with this disclosure. I mean, Memoirs itself is not on the New York Times bestseller. I mean, No Poll is Dead Book is on that list. So he likes to do things underground. But the lyrics go like this. Someday they're going to tear down Maggie's farm. Someday they're going to burn down that old barn. Someday they're going to dig up all that land. Someday they're going to find that missing man. And then it goes on to say, Somebody, somewhere let her down, and now Maggie can't be found. She ran Junior's farm into the ground. Maggie, Maggie, where have you gone? Somebody, somewhere let her down. Now Maggie's gone and can't be found. Everybody's saying we should burn the whole thing down. And then it ends with, Maggie, Maggie, where have you gone? Maggie, Maggie, 
what have you done? Maggie, Maggie, run. So very interesting lyrics. I think it's tying in Maggie May. It's tying in the song Junior's Farm. Yeah. It does appear to me, Steve, that Famous Groupies is singing about Billy's Farm. Yes? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And and the fact that in the background you hear bagpipes, which, you know, what do you associate bagpipes with? Exactly, it's Scotland. Scottish, Scottish instrument, you know. You don't usually hear, you know, bagpipes in any other song except for in Scotland, you know. It's usually some kind of, you know, instrument used over there. So him putting that in there, it really gives that Scottish feel to it. Because I've had other people say, well, it could be another farm in America. But I really, why would they use bagpipes then? Right. But I, what I'm really trying to find out is who is Maggie? Even the creator of that song, or Kirkcaldy, basically doesn't know who Maggie is either. And these were ghost-written songs, so Kirkcaldy, I don't believe, writes them himself. Right. No, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. You can always cut this out, Mike, if we can't. No, he mentioned it to me, too. He said that his grandfather was the one that was the ghostwriter, Patrick. Right, yep. I even think I know who that is, but I promised him I won't say. So. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. And it's on his website, Famous Groupie's website. Yep. There's a blog entry that talks about Patrick McKenzie, and that Patrick was a songwriter and a ghostwriter for Billy. Now, Patrick McKenzie is not his real name, so there's still a mystery as to who that person really is. Very, very interesting, because like I said, to me, Famous Groupies, as soon as I became aware of them, this was a couple of years ago, and I heard the music, I said, okay, this has got to be part of the disclosure process, that at some point, their role is going to be amped up as we move along. And, and as I mentioned in my uh, a video a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I think that it's possible that Billy probably has another couple of years left before he either A, retires or he departs from this physical realm. So I would expect that all of these disclosure threads are going to come together as we get closer and closer to the end. I think there's going to be a big crescendo. So Steve, did you want me to run the, the drone footage? Yeah, with the song, I think would be great. He said we could use the song, which was really kind of him, I think. And uh, I think he's going to get a lot of a lot of sales on that song after this, you know. Okay. Is there anything about the drone footage, if I run it now, that you wanted to talk about or just run it with the song? Um, the one thing I could say is we didn't get anything with the tulips on it. We didn't even uh, get close to the farm, which is a shame because you can only go a certain distance with this type particular drone, which is a pretty good one. John bought it with his own money, and I was proud of him that he tried to get in there. But, you know, what I, what I think it does show is how desolate it is up there. I mean, if you're going to hide a body or bodies, it's a perfect place. There's nothing around there so, for miles upon miles. So what we're looking at here, because I'm running it right now, is that property the farm or no? Directly in front of you. Directly in front of you. You see the, the small copse of trees? It's just to the right of that. It's the middle copse of trees. It's there. That's the farm. You can't really see it because we're still too far out. Top center, John? Yeah, that's that. There's not a whole lot up there. No, there's no other houses. You know, I think John says there's a few farms close by. You know, and the other thing, they're not farming on that land at all. Wondering why this land was kept other than what I think it's about, you know. You know, what other reason is there to keep that kind of parcel of land? And again, we should probably mention that the way this farm came about, Biological Paul purchased the farm a few months before he passed away, which we believe was September of 1966. And the reasons that I read as to why he bought the farm was to alleviate some of the tax burden from the money that he and the rest of the Beatles were making, but specifically him because it was his property that he bought. And when he died, Billy inherited the farm. It seems kind of interesting to me that Paul buys his farm three or four months, I forgot the exact time frame or period, before he dies... And then Billy inherits the farm. It's almost like he bought his own cemetery plot, I guess is what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. A lot of people said that when we ran the first couple of uh, videos, you know, in the comments section. Yeah. You know, bought the farm. I guess that was an expression after Yeah, what? bought the farm. Yeah, it means you died. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Interesting, too, you know, in that the other video, I think it was the second video we did. You know, it shows Crowley, and you and I both thought it shows the standing stone behind Crowley. And, you know, what was interesting about that, too, in that painting, it shows Crowley with kind of like a braided uh, beard. Yeah. And you're, you're going to see that in some of the Osiris things coming up where 
you know, King Tut and all the Egyptians had that braided beard, too. Yeah. You know, I just think it's interesting that I believe Crowley was on that land, too, at one time. I don't know the time period, but it seems like that was a picture of him. Well, maybe what I'll do is I will uh, pull that particular slide up from the yeah. previous presentation. And I'll slip it in. So for anybody who hadn't seen part one and part two, they'll see what we're talking about. Okay, so uh, so Maggie's Farm, very, very interesting song. And, uh, and I will play that for the audience. So the next slide in is from page 146 of, is this Memoirs of Billy's Back? Memoirs. Um, I just saw that. I guess it's the 50th anniversary, too, of the Ram album. The sacrificial stuff, I, I keep having arguments, like I said, on uh, the right, written arguments, but on sacrificial stuff. A lot of people don't believe it. And I believe it's still going on to this day, all these sacrifices and uh you know, at least since the Robert Johnson days and before that, in biblical times, they sacrificed lambs. You know, so I believe there's some kind of power or rit in a ritual like that. The Mayans did it, you know, so I just thought this was an interesting page in memoirs. Well, people who want to argue it and go into denial is because they don't understand how this realm really works. And they don't understand that the people who control yeah. are occultists and they are engaged in magic and they are engaged in ritual. And it is something that's difficult to get your head wrapped around. If you don't know about it and it's never discussed, then you're just going to think that it's crazy talk when it comes up. 
But for those of us that have taken a look into uh, how the controllers operate, we know that ritual sacrifice is something that they do do. The 27 Club has loaded up with artists that made it big and then hit the age of 27, and that was it. They were gone. The other way that it's done, if you don't pass away at a young age, is you will live a long life, but you're going to work and work and work until you drop dead. And this is what's happened to Billy. This is what's happened to Mick Jagger. This is what's happened to Bob Dylan. Yep. If you look at the band Def Leppard, I mean, these guys are nonstop touring all the time. So all of this fame and fortune comes with a price. And Billy calls it in memoirs, death for success, which means you enter into a Faustian bargain, a deal with the devil, to have your life script rewritten. And when it's rewritten, you're going to have the fame, you're going to have the fortune, you're going to have a long-lasting legacy, which is the case with the Beatles, and in particular with Paul McCartney, but it comes at a price. So when you make that deal, when the devil comes knocking, he's going to get what it is that you owe him. The most famous dialogue was between Bob Dylan and Ed Bradley. Yes. Going back about 20 years ago, I think it was, when Bob Dylan talked about making a deal with the chief commander. Yeah. Who was he talking about? So anyway, now the interesting thing about this particular uh, page in memoirs is Billy's talking about the sacrifice, and it's on page 146. One plus four plus six equals 11, a master number in the occult and Freemasonry. One of the things that you will note, or you should note if you're reading memoirs or if you're reading Billy's back, is the page numbers mean something. All right, so in this page, I'll read this, Steve, so uh, you don't have to. The name Ram, R-A-M, replacing A. McCartney, is in capital letters on the album. And Billy's talking about his Ram album. It reverses as Mar, M-A-R, for its hidden sacrificial meaning. The sacrificial substitute for the man is marred by the holy offering. The essentially plain song, Ram On, repeatedly telling me to do my Ram work, furthers this idea of some religious sacrifice. In ancient sacrificial rituals, they cut out the heart. In a symbolic shadow, Paul's heart, as all else taken from him, was given to me, his heir. Remember, it is a reversal. Instead of the ram being made the sacrifice, it is the man, the dead Paul, whose heart is given away to the surviving ram. And what I should note is the bolded out letters on this page are R-A-M, Ram, replacing A. McCartney, and also, to go along with what we were just talking about, Steve, the bolded out letters also say it is a sacrifice. Yeah, kind of gives you chills, you know. When you read that stuff, to me it does anyway. So. Yeah, I, this is the thing. You know, there are dark aspects of the book. There's no doubt about it. Memoirs, the full-blown memoirs, contains the darker aspects of the story, whereas Billy's back does not. Uh, and that was done intentionally, according to Tom, because some people just cannot get their heads wrapped around the, the darker pieces of this narrative. So if you read Billy's back, those parts are skipped. But if you want the whole nine yards... You're going to have to read the memoirs of Billy Shears, the full book. All right, so here's an interesting uh, slide here, Steve. You've got uh, biological Paul McCartney on the left, and you've got Kurt Cobain on the right, who, by the way, is in the 27 Club. So what were your thoughts about this particular image? Um, before I get into that, Mike, I, um, a lady on our site had asked me about the Beatles, and they said if they were already famous up to, like, 1966, you know, before he was sacrificed, why would they need to make a pact with the devil or for a sacrifice? I, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that. If you could just say anything about that before I get into this. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. I mentioned before the controllers, the committee of 300 down to Tavistock. Tavistock is tucked in under the committee of 300, just to kind of set the stage here a little bit. There is an organizational structure. This is very important to understand. There is an internationalist structure that's in place. The people who run the show are occultists. They are into magic. They are into ritual. Now, the goal of the Committee of 300 via Tavistock was to re-engineer the world. And the best way to understand it, by the way, 
is to go read John Coleman's book on the Committee of 300. I, I talk about it a lot. Yeah. All right? You've you got to read that book, folks. You really do. Because once you read it, you'll understand how this world really works. There is a complete structure in place, an internationalist structure that runs the world. Now, so what they did was they put in play not just the Beatles, but other psychological operations that were geared toward changing the very fabric of society, getting people away from traditional values, getting people away from Christianity. In fact, in memoirs, uh, it tells us that the Illuminati declared war on Christianity in 1962. And when did the Beatles come into prominence? 1962. Right. The whole occult piece of this, the sacrifice, is meant to manifest their objectives. They believe that sacrifices, the energy that's involved with sacrifices, think of in terms of sacrificing to the gods to get what it is that you're looking for. Think of it in those terms. And so the sacrifice of Paul was very important because not only did it create the energy of the magic to bring about and to manifest the change, but it also created a new religion, the religion of Paulism. Biological Paul, think of him in terms of being a godhead in the physical world, like Jesus. And then he died. And then he was resurrected, born again, through Billy. Now, all of this might sound kooky to a lot of people, but all of this ritual is very, very important to the magician, to the occultists. Yeah. So the Beatles became a new religion. People worshipped the Beatles. To so many people, to millions upon millions of people across the world, the Beatles are gods. People worship them. So Paul McCartney represents the Graven Christ figure who died and was resurrected. And he was resurrected through Billy. Again, you know, people who don't understand how these occultists operate, work, how they bring about their, their version of reality won't understand this. Right. It's the same reason why Brian Jones was sacrificed for the Rolling Stones. It was to bring about the popularity and the fame for the Rolling Stones. It was the same reason that Kurt Cobain was taken out. Yeah. It was the same reason Jimi Hendrix was taken out. It's the same reason Janis Joplin was taken out. Yeah. It was the same reason John Bonham was taken out. The same reason Keith Moon was taken out. Yeah. These were all sacrifices, sacrificial deaths to further along, A, the popularity of the band, because the band is part of the toolbox of the controllers to change society. It's not just about the band members becoming wealthy. It's about the ability of the controllers to use that band as tools to implement the change they want to put in place. I see. That is what it's all about. So, again, you know, I, I know I get animated about this because I have explained it so, so many times, so many times. And I have pointed out so many occulted clues, especially the numerology in all of the Beatles' works, in all of Billy's work to this day. McCartney 3, that album, his most recent album, is loaded up with all kinds of occult symbolism and numbers. So this goes into this image here, Steve, because... These images are also occulted. Well, first of all, you know, I, I always like Nirvana quite a bit, too. So, you know, I look through things. I, I watched a movie called Soaked in Bleach, which was very good. It, it was about that Kurt Cobain was murdered and just didn't take a drug overdose, you know, because he had he had more than enough, I believe, heroin or something in him, in him some kind of opiates in him, but more than he would ever take. It, it, you know, it was definitely enough to kill him. Plus, they said the angle of him shooting his head off was just wrong. Um, right. You know, so I thought that movie was pretty interesting. And they they think Courtney Love was behind it, at least in that movie. I, I really couldn't tell you. She's still free today. So, But what I started, I started looking through things about Nirvana. And, it, you know, I was interested in the age he died, too. Because, like you said, you know, it was around that time, you know, of Paul's sacrifice and everything. And then I started looking at pictures I was finding. And 
lo and behold, it's almost the same kind of doll heads, you know, dismembered heads and bodies and things that, you know, was, was with, with the Beatle cover there, the butcher album that got pulled off. I guess it went out to a, to a little little bit of people, and then they pulled the album. They thought it was a little too grotesque, you know. Right. But, you know, Kurt Cobain was obsessed with the doll stuff and things on dismemberment. And, you know, even in his album In Utero, I believe it was, it shows all kinds of fetuses, baby parts, you know, all kinds of really strange things you wouldn't think to see. And I just thought it was such a similarity in this cover. It just shows his beheaded head looks like on a platter. You know, I'm sure he's under a table, but it, it was very strange to see these two pictures next to each other, I thought. My understanding of um, the baby parts and what we're seeing here, the doll's heads, has to do with mind control. Yeah. It has to do with the breakdown of the mind. Okay. In mind control programs, that breaking down starts when you are a child. In memoirs, Billy tells us that he was in a mind control program at the age of three. Right. As well as being tutored by Alistair Crowley. So when we look at the butcher cover and then this image that you're showing of Kurt Cobain, what this tells me is this is symbolic of mind control programs. Yep. You know, what they do is they, they hide in plain sight. So they'll put these images out and people think, oh, they're so artistic and this and that. It's so uh, avant-garde. Well, not really. To me, what they're telling me is that these two guys were in mind control programs. Yeah. Shows there's a connection for sure to me. Absolutely. And the other thing I want to address, Steve, is that there are people out there that say that the Beatles really didn't want to do the Butcher cover. Yeah, they really didn't want to do that. It's nonsense. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert into this presentation a clip of John Lennon in an interview where he discusses the fact that he was all for the Butcher cover because he said the other photo shoots that they were doing were boring. And so this one was different. It was exciting. And he was really pushing for it. I'm going to play that clip from John Lennon, and you're going to see that they were on board with doing the Butcher cover. What? How did that happen, that, that uh, album cover that never saw the light of day, or if it did, got pulled off? Or it quickly? went out. Um, we took the pictures in London at a, one of those photo sessions. By then, we were really sort of you know, beginning to hate it. A photo session was a big ordeal, and, you know, you had to try and look normal, you know, and you didn't feel it. And uh, the photographer was a bit of a surrealist, you know, and he brought along all these babies and pieces of meat and doctor's coats, so we really got into it, and that's how we felt. Yeah. yeah. So we sort of, I especially, <laughs> pushed for it to be an album cover, you know, just to break the image, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it got out in America, and they printed it, about 60,000 got out, and then there was some kind of fuss as usual and they were all sent back in or withdrawn and they stuck that awful looking picture which you have in front of you of us sitting looking just as deadbeat but supposed to be happy-go-lucky foursome you look very unhappy yeah right right, right. so we tried to you know do something different album yeah. covers were much simpler then right just yeah cover well, you and... just walk in take your photo and walk out mm -hmm. especially in america because we we made only say 10 albums actually in america there seemed to be 30 of them and so we would design a cover or have control a bit more of our own covers in England. But America always had more albums, so they always needed another picture, another cover. We used to be very upset because England would have 14 tracks per album, yeah. and then we'd only get 12. Well, they, 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 we used to say, why can't we put 14 out in America you know, and stop them? Because we, we, we would sequence the albums, how, they should, how we thought they should sound, and we'd put a lot of work into the sequencing, too. And we almost got to not care what happened in America because it was always different. They wouldn't let us put 14 out. They said there was some rule or something that we... And greed, we all, greed, I think. Well, was whatever it was, you know. They just... And so we almost didn't care what happened to the albums in America until we started coming over more and noticing, like, on the eight tracks that have outtakes and mumbling on the beginning, which is interesting now, but it used to drive us crackers because we'd make an album and then they'd, they'd keep two from every album. Okay, yeah, so uh, you have here a slide that um, talks about doll parts from um, Courtney Love. Hall's 1994 song, Doll Parts, was a reference to Cobain's obsession with dolls. He made a lot of art surrounding them. Courtney Love wrote about wanting to be the dolls in the opening lines, 
I am doll eyes, doll mouth, doll legs. And then later in the song, he only loves those things because he loves to see them break. Yeah. Very telling. I was saying before in the previous image, it's the breaking down of the mind. Right. And here she's saying he only loves those things because he loves to see them break. Yeah. Somebody might say, oh, you're reading into it, Mike. I don't think so. <laughs> no, when I read that, even that song, I, I, I kind of liked Courtney Love's music back then, too. And I, I thought that was a very powerful song. It was probably one of her best, you know. Yeah. The actual song. And uh, you could hear the pain in her, you know, just in her, the way she was singing. I think she couldn't get through to him or he was, you know, too much on the drugs or something, you know, that he didn't spend enough time with. Her. I don't know what it was, but it seemed like that was a lot of pain in that song. Well, according to that documentary that you mentioned, uh, the private investigator thinks that she may have been involved in his death. Yeah, I think she was supposed to be getting divorced from him or something. Maybe she didn't want it or vice versa. I have to. Yeah. It's only so much you can do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the next slide gave us a definition of dismember. So what's this all about? You know, it said that he liked to collect dismembered doll parts, you know, or, you know, he, his favorite thing to do. This is Kirk Cobain I'm talking about was to go into a medical supply store where they had like fetuses and then break them apart, you know, small children type of thing. You know, it was a very bizarre thing that he was into, I guess. But this dismemberment thing, I, I even worked at an insurance company at one time. And they talk about the word dismemberment. You know, it's if you get in an accident and lose a part. But I also thought in the way of a dismember of a band member, you take one away, that's kind of a dismemberment of the band. I'm just saying what comes to mind to me. The definition of this member to cut off or disjoin the limbs, members. They use the words members or parts of to break up or tear into pieces. So, you know, to break up a band, which is what happened with the Beatles, too, in a way. Yep. So I thought I'd throw that word out there. <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. And we, we can certainly apply dismember to the butcher cover. Yep. Okay. The next slide leads into. Uh, was Kurt Cobain and Paul McCartney sacrificed? So based upon what we just talked about, Steve, I'm going to say that, uh, well, Memoirs tells us that biological Paul was sacrificed, and uh, it's very possible that Kurt Cobain was also sacrificed because that documentary, um, I forgot the name of the documentary. Um, Soaked in Bleach, I think it was. Soaked in Bleach, yeah. The private investigator that was looking into the Cobain death yeah. He had some serious, serious doubts about, like you said, Steve, whether it was uh, a suicide, which was how it was classified. Right. Right. So something happened. So there was foul play is what this private investigator had concluded. So, you know, was it a sacrifice? Some people might say, well, because he was taken out doesn't necessarily mean it was a sacrifice. But as we were talking before about uh, like the 27 Club, yeah. it's very possible that it was a sacrifice. Now, we're going to show you two images, folks, that Steve has uh, pulled in here. They're very, very interesting. And so the first one, Steve, is uh, Cobain again, and he's got sunglasses on. Yeah, 1960-some type of sunglasses um, on there. But what's interesting when you see the next slide, and also David Grohl, the other band member who was with the Foo Fighters now, the lead member of that, he was playing guitar instead of drums now. In Nirvana, he was a drummer, obviously. But I thought it was cool. It showed the one-eye symbolism again there, too. So that's pretty much a big clue that they're part of the whole mind control thing. Yep, I'm going to read something that I found. Yeah. And this comes from a site called monkeyandelf.com. And the title of the article is The Sign of One Eye, Origin and Occult Meaning. And so I found something very interesting, Steve. It says... Covering the eyes by wearing a helmet, sunglasses, etc. can mean a mystery, a failure to see the whole truth, or a hoax. The eye often means judgment and power. And this came from uh, the Dictionary of Symbolism from the University of Michigan. So, very interesting. So, the sunglasses could mean a mystery, a failure to see the whole truth, or a hoax. Okay, and so if we go to the next slide, we've got this image of Paul McCartney and there's a, a gal wearing the same sunglasses that Kurt Cobain had in the previous image. Yep, and it's interesting, the NASA suit too, I'm not sure, you know, it was around that time period, I guess. Um, yeah. 
But they're very bizarre looking sunglasses, you know. It's just a little bit weird that you have Cobain wearing the glasses and then you have the same glasses in an image with Paul McCartney. It's a little weird. Yeah. Audrey Hepburn had also worn those glasses in a white outfit. I, I didn't have the picture, but, you know, I found her with the same sunglasses on, too. It's some famous designer. Yep. What I think is interesting even to this day is David Grohl is uh, very involved with uh, Billy. Yes. He plays with him a lot. I think when he was inducted in the Hall of Fame or something, uh, you know, he played there, played Hey Bulldog the whole bit. Right. And also, um, recently he just did another video that you might have seen with Mick Jagger, who's also a Tavistock, you know. So he's he's very involved with these same type of people. Kind of shows you they're all in that club, I believe. You know, I could be speculating again, but it sure looks that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. Grohl is definitely in the club, and... It's almost as if he worships Billy yep. in the videos I've seen. Yeah. Okay, so some food for thought, folks. The glasses, the sunglasses, does it mean something? Does it not mean something? I don't know. In any case, it's kind of strange that we see them in a Kurt Cobain image and then we see them in a Paul McCartney image, a biological Paul McCartney yep. image. All right, so the next slide is we, we're getting into uh, some more of the whole Billy and Viv Vivian Stanshaw from the Bonzos, and I'm, I'm assuming Ralph put this together? Yeah, he's really good at it, and uh, he always tells me, he goes, the eyes line up and everything falls into place from there. And he's done some, you know, with other types of people, and it never matches up. But one of the reasons I wanted to throw these in there, again, I have so many people, especially on other PID sites that I belong to, they, they don't believe in the Stanshaw thing. They just can't fathom it. I, I totally 100% believe it now. But I think in the beginning, I remember asking you, and you had done that video, you stared, you stared me to your video on the Stanshaw Acro connection. And, you know, now I can't unsee it, but before I couldn't see it. So I understand some of these people, but I just wanted to drive it home again that these, these are some new ones from Ralph, and I think they're very good. Well, the problem with some folks that are looking into the poll is dead yeah. research, Steve, is that it's not that they don't see it. They don't want to see it. That could be, yep. They don't want to see it because it doesn't fit their narrative. Yeah. Okay, so they've been marching along with a particular storyline for a long time. And during that process, they didn't bring in the Stanshall connection. Right. Right. Now, I would not have brought in the Stanshall connection myself until I read it in memoirs. And so what I did was, I'm like, well, you know, who is this guy, Vivian Stanshall? So I had to do some research into who he was. And then I had to break it down, taking a very close look at Stanshall and take a look at Billy. And as you go along and you move along the research and you do the investigation, Billy played Vivian Stanshall of the Bonzos. There were at least two Vivian Stanshalls. There was the Stanshall that played with the Bonzos with Neil Innes. Neil later on went on to Ruddle fame. And I also believe Neil Innes was a ghostwriter, possibly for the Beatles and for Billy. Billy and Neil Innes were very close. And then there was another Vivian Stanshall that was on Billy's payroll. He was hired by Billy. He was an, an actor and a musician. And he looks different than the Stanshall you're looking at at the bottom right of this particular slide. Right. At first glance, you might see some similarities but the second Stanshall, who I refer to as Street Viv, who I now refer to as Victor, because that's the name they give us in Wikipedia, yep. he was hired by Billy so that Billy can do both his McCartney character and the Stanshall character. They can run in parallel. So that he didn't have a situation like the old joke is, well, how come Bruce Wayne and Batman are never in the same room together? Billy could have them in the same room together. He could be McCartney and Victor could be Stanshall. Right. But the Vivian Stanshall of the Bonzos is Billy, and it is a character that Billy created. Vivian Stanshall is not a real person. He's a character. He's a character that Billy created. Right. And the reason why Billy played in the Bonzos was because he didn't have to be Paul McCartney. Yeah. He can make music any way he wanted to. He could play any style of music. He could joke around. He can goof around and not have to worry about the whole Beatles and McCartney aspect. So the Bonzos was basically a release valve for him yeah. to go out and be able to do those things that he couldn't do right. under the guise of being Paul McCartney. 
And Ralph has said this to me, too. The nose and the eyes always match up. Yeah, you can see a little bit difference in the nostrils there. Billy's had nose work done yeah. over time. So his nose, going back to when he was stanchial, is going to be different. But where the nose is on his face, the distance between his eyes, yeah. how's that going to happen? You could say, well, it's just coincidental. Not on all of the pictures that Ralph has put together, it's not coincidental. And I, in my presentation, the McCartney, Stanshaw, and Ackrell research that I did, I go to great detail to show how their profiles are the same. I've gotten to the point with this, Steve, where I don't argue with anybody anymore. I don't pay attention, any attention whatsoever to what goes on on uh, those Paul is Dead Facebook pages. It's just wheel spinning. It really is. And yeah. they are talking to themselves. Somebody puts a post up, five or six of them get all lathered up, and it's the five or six of them going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Well, why would I pay any attention to that? I've got a YouTube channel. My Paul is Dead channel has 10,000 subscribers. My main channel has almost 28,000. Since I started this work back in 2016, 1.7 million people have watched my work or listened to my work. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. Oh, I just wanted to ask you, can I do a plug for the Facebook site I, I run? Because it's, you know, yeah, it, it's good, good to talk about it because we do believe in this uh, Stanshaw bit, you know, so you're not going to get driven off like a Frankenstein monster here. But it's called uh, The Many Faces of uh, Billy, Billy Shepard. You know, if I join it after watching the video, I'd be glad to have them as long as they share kind of the same mindset. I, I don't want any more arguments on there, you know, so. Anyway, I just figured I'd give us a plug. You know? All right. What I could do, Steve, is put the link down in the description box. And folks, don't troll. Yeah. If you're going to go to Steve's site, go there with good intentions. Yep. And be an adult. Be mature. Okay. So let's uh, go to the next slide. This one here. Okay. So this is Ackrell and Billy. Yep. Which are one and the same also. And I, to tell you the truth, I really had trouble with Ackrell at first because I just thought, the faces don't match up, but I'll tell you what, here, faces match up perfectly. I think Ralph really outdid himself here. Um, finding, you know, and I didn't find these two pictures. He found them and uh, does great work. It looks exactly the same to me, you know, the faces. I've got uh, two or three slides, Steve, where I, I did a compare and uh, where he maps to um, to Acryl. Now, here's the thing about Acryl, okay? So, yeah. so people understand. There were Two Ackrells, and Phil Ackrell is not a real person, just like Vivian Stanshall. He's a character yep. that Billy created. Now, Phil Ackrell is a stage name that Billy used when he played with the Diplomats, a band that he was in with Denny Lane, yep. going way back into the early 1960s, and also Bev Bevan was the drummer. Now, Bev Bevan went on to go play with ELO, right? Electric Light Orchestra, tied to Jeff Lynn, right? So all of these guys... All of these people are all networked in. So what happened was when things got busier for Billy, he had to dedicate more time to the Beatles and the Beatle work he was doing. He had to spend less time with the Phil Ackrell character and the diplomats. So what he did was he essentially leased the part out to a guy by the name of Phil Ralston. Right. And so the problem with the whole Phil Ackrell piece is that there are two of them. Yeah. There were two Phil Ackrells. There's the one that Billy played early on, and then the role was assumed by Phil Ralston. And again, this one is a harder one to get your your arms wrapped around. What I'll do is I'll slip in two of my slides that I think make it obvious as well. I'll put that in here. Yeah. The, you know, the, the thing is, though, if you put Phil Ackrell's face, like, say, in this picture, and you put it next to... The one in the previous picture of of the Stanshaw character, yeah, really don't look alike. You know that's what's so bizarre about it. I think that's what confuses a lot of people, including me at times. But when you put these up together with pictures of Bill, they definitely seem to match up. So I I don't know why they're so different when you compare both characters to each other. Maybe because there's different makeup on, or you know I don't know what it is. Different latex on. The acryl piece of this is more difficult to get your head wrapped around. It is. Yeah. And again, I, I believe the reason is because we are probably comparing not the Billy version of Ackrell as much as the Phil Ralston version of Ackrell. Okay. Yeah. That's what I think is going on. 
could be. This definitely matches here, though, no doubt in my mind. Yeah, this is this is pretty good. I mean, the yeah. the eyes, the nose. Yep. All right, so we'll put this in, and I'll add some additional slides, two or three slides that I have where you can see that uh, he played the uh, the actual character. Yep. All right, so if we go to the next slide, we've got Billy playing the trumpet. Then the slide after that, we've got Viv in blackface, not exactly politically correct, right. playing the trumpet as well. And uh, there's a story out there, of course, that uh, people believe that biological Paul McCartney could play the trumpet because the official narrative says that his father bought him a trumpet. Do you know that story? I heard it, yeah, but I, I've never seen him playing it, let's put it that way, but I've seen Billy play exactly. it. Exactly. Stanchel. Yes, and Billy plays it as Stanchel. So, uh, yeah, okay, so we'll put those two slides in there as well. I just threw those in there because, you know, similar type of thing. So. Okay, yeah, no, good, it's fine. All right, so uh, then we have the song from McCartney 3, When Winter Comes. And so the first slide here, Steve, is uh, you've got two foxes. So you, you take it from here. Yeah, so, I mean, to me, you know, it could be wrong that it was like a, a coincidence. But, you know, if he wrote maybe just that line in later, I think it's in the beginning of the song, too. So on McCartney 3. You know, to me, that's John Lennox on the left there, that first fox, and then his wife on the right. They're at the gate at Hyde Park, you know. It shows yep. to me clearly that that's what they're doing there. You know, they're they're going through a fence. You know, it's, he said the gate was open, but still. Um, in the song, it talks about that they must mend the fence, fence by the acre lot. Two young foxes have been nosing around, so there they are. <laughs> And then we've got them now, the next slide shows them, obviously, that they've gotten past the gate. So John and his wife are yep. now walking on the property. It mentioned a lot of reeds in the song, too, and I believe those are reeds in the picture on either side. And I haven't watched the video, so this is from Billy's video? Yeah, you really should watch the video, Mike. It's great, you know. Okay. That's from the video, so I just, you know, took my iPhone and just snapped it at different parts that I thought were interesting. Kind of freeze frame it. And then we've got this guy here. We don't know if that's Billy or not, but what are your thoughts about this? I, I believe it is Billy at High Park. And, uh, you know, it has has the full beard and uh, the longer hair, more of a farmer type. And then you see the three beetles in the back as sheep. You can see like sheep on the hill. They're very abstract, though. At first, I didn't even think those were sheep. I wasn't sure what they were. Yeah. But I believe they're sheep. Show them his legs. And, uh, it's got the black cat in there, which is also, I think, there in a lot of occult things. Like the black cat, if it crosses your path, it just happened to morning. It happened to the guy in front of me. So, you know, I always kind of freak out if I see a black cat and it grows across the road. The other interesting thing I noticed about this particular image is uh, the guy has reddish hair, which is what Billy has. Yeah, exactly. I think I even mentioned that before. I thought it was kind of reddish hair. And I sent a picture recently. I don't know if you can throw that in there at all, but I sent you a picture where Bill just recently, he doesn't dye his arm hair anymore, and it's very reddish hair on his arms. You can actually see the red hair. Yeah, I have that. I, I downloaded it. I'll put that in. Yeah, you know, even at his age now, it's showing red hair on his arms. And I remember him saying in memoirs, he used to dye all his body hair. So, you know, right. that all adds up. And then we've got uh, two kids playing with a wheelbarrow. Yeah, so, you know, which is his children from that time period. And, uh, you know, now they're grown kids now. But at first I thought that was the shepherd's crook in the wheelbarrow. But, you know, as you said, it might be the shovel. Yeah. But the shovel also, when they're planting the bulbs, it has that flat top uh, handle on it, similar to that. And what I thought was strange about it, why was the cat so high up like there, that black cat again? Going yeah. across that. It's almost in the shape of a cross, like a crucifix, with the cat up there. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just seeing these strange symbolisms in there. Like, what is... You know, maybe they had a black cat at the farm. I, I didn't research that. Maybe they did at the time, but it's, it's kind of in a strange spot. What cat do you know jumps that high in the air? All right. And then the next image, we have uh, two lambs, black and white. Yeah, the black sheep of the family. You know, and uh, Duality. Yeah, the duality of black and white, which Bill uses a lot. Like in that Who Cares video I keep bringing up. Right. You know, there's tons of black and white images and... There you go. You got black baby lambs, sacrificial lambs again. I guess this is Linda. Yeah, I mean, it looks a lot like Linda. And as you know from, uh, I don't know if maybe we can get a picture from, the, I should have put it in myself, so I apologize for that. But the red trim on the barns is the same as at what High Park 
farm has, right, John? Um, the, do the doors are all red, yes. I, oh, the doors are all painted red. The red roof's all been changed now. Somebody else uh, had pointed out that it could be a farm in America. I don't think it is. I think this red trim is, is a clue there. Yeah. I, I would tend to believe that he's showing his farm, not a farm in America, but that's just me. No, this, this, if you watch the whole feel of that, that song and everything, to me, picking his life from back in the High Park days, from the 60s to the early 70s, you know, and you'll see, I, I put a photograph from another website, another Facebook website about Billy's farm up there. And, uh, you know, you'll see the similarities of the character himself, you know, looking just like yeah. photographs from back then. So I believe, you know, it's definitely him and his life with Linda. Linda had the blonde hair. It's definitely them. And that white horse you had talked about to me a little bit, too. Yeah, yep. Pale horse or white horse of the apocalypse, you know. I know they had horses up, too. It shows them riding. Right. Yep. There's a lot of pictures with him and Linda with horses, a lot. Yeah. Of riding horses, yeah. Yeah, and the famous one with the standing stone, too. You know, it has Yeah. that, too. Yeah. All right. And then we have this image here, and it looks like he's wearing a mask. Yeah, it looked a little strange, too, to me. And, and I thought the hair got a little bit darker. You know, you saw it earlier. It was a little bit redder. Well, if he is wearing a mask, again, like, you know, the whole mask thing is a ritual. Yeah. And I don't know if he's waving high there or what in the video. I can't remember. It might be. I think it, he might have been waving to the children there or Linda. Okay. It's a still shot, so I've forgotten by now. I'll have to watch the uh, the video. And then you've got um, this image of uh, Billy with the brown horse. Yeah. And you know, the reason I put that in is uh, I had never seen a lot of these particular pictures. But, it, you know, I think it looks just like the farmer guy. It, it's a cartoon depiction, but, you know, to me, it looks like the same area. Yeah. It shows what's interesting about that slide, too. It just shows the dates he was up there, too. Yeah. Also, Steve, the fencing is the same. Yeah, it is. Very close. Okay. All right. So then we've got, uh, here's another image of Billy. At the shepherd's crook. And, uh, you know, it's... Yeah overalls on there i don't think but it's that whole farmer look you know he's whole into the whole farmer scene there all right and then we've got uh here's a an image with the standing stone in the center yeah exactly yeah and uh they're jumping off of other stones there john did you happen to see those stones when you're up there it looks like they're kind of far off yeah there's little stones lying about everywhere they're common all over the place that would be right in front of the house that's probably looking for the house out the way okay and then we have linda by the stone yeah and uh, I'd never seen that image either until I got on that site, you know. And uh, I don't know what that, uh, there's a rectangular, it looks almost like it was on there with chalk or if it was inscribed. Yeah. John said it, since he's been up there, he never saw that, you know. I think I asked him before. It also looks like on the top there, there might be some inscriptions up a little higher. You know, I don't know. You know, maybe at one time and then the lichen and the moss took over. I, maybe there was something inscribed in there. And then we've got the image of Billy. Yeah, we've seen this one before. But what always stands out to me with these images, you know, he's up by the stone, his head against the stone kind of. And uh, I remember reading in memoirs he liked to be close to Paul. He tried to uh, get his spirit into him by being close to him. And like I said, if he's up at the farm, which I truly believe he is, you know, that's what he might even been doing in that picture there. These are all High Park pictures. Because the site itself, if I can remember what it is, I'll tell you, but... uh. It's just a site about High Park Farm in Scotland. They don't say much on there. They just have pictures and things. So On this black and white image, Steve, you can really see, like you look at the background, how vast yeah, it's huge. the land is. I think John can attest to that. You know, there's just nothing around there. You're not going to find a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's out there, you know. So. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And that's an interesting cap he has on his head? Yeah. Then James there, you know, with the reddish hair, even at that age there. Yep. Yeah, that looks like a very Scottish hat to me. I don't know if John can say anything about it. Is that Irish or Scottish cap, you think, John? Looks more Irish to me. And here he is, and he has a Dalmatian, black and white. Yeah, and I, I never knew he had that dog. So, you know, maybe it was somebody else's dog visiting that day. I always, always thought it was only Martha. I also didn't realize, but Martha, the dog there, was actually Paul McCartney's dog first. And so he, he inherited the dog. It's interesting. I read up on that. The one thing I've noticed with these uh, these images of Billy, too, is that you can see he's a tall guy. Yeah. Right? Six, six, two. He's not a, a short guy. No, he's got a large stature to him, yeah. And here he is with a very 
strange mustache. <laughs> First thing I thought is I am the walrus, you know, <laughs> the walrus mustache there, you know. But yeah. I, you know, you can see the red gate there again, too. Yep. Into the red. And then we've got this image, which I always thought, I know you have the uh, the crook there, but his face always seemed very weird to me in this image. Yeah. Some some people definitely think he has a double. Yeah. You know, and I've heard a guy mention a few, more than a few times that the film with the reporters is his double. And part of it was also being that I guess he couldn't grow a beard within two weeks as full as it was. That could have been makeup, too. I mean, you can, you know, actors can put on a fake beard for sure. Look, I was told that from the very beginning, each Beatle had three doubles. So there were four of each. So the original, the real Paul McCartney, the real John Lennon, and then there were three doubles or lookalikes. So each Beatle, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, all had three doubles or lookalikes. And that's from day one. And in memoirs, Tom tells us that Billy still has a double today. So again, when we look at these images, folks, it is hard to tell sometimes who you're looking at because they went to great lengths to create these doubles and these lookalikes. And what I've mentioned, Steve and John, in a couple of presentations that I did, that what they were looking to do, especially with, uh, with Paul, was to create a composite view of Paul McCartney. So if you go through the timeline and you look at the different images of Billy and doubles and lookalikes, right. you're going to see that there are definitely differences in facial appearance. But the way they rolled this psychological operation out was to get people acclimated to seeing somebody that kind of looked like Paul McCartney. And then they put him within the context of the Beatles. They put him in the context of Wings. They put him in the context of Billy doing his solo work. And what happens? People just say, oh, that's Paul McCartney. Right. You know, so I, to me, what they did was they created a composite personification right. of this character named Paul McCartney. So this this one always bugged me a little bit because I, I don't know about that picture. <laughs> but in any case, he's got the, the shepherd's crook again. Yeah. And I, I could believe I can hear what you're saying about that, because, you know, when you watch Let It Be, uh, that, that album, I'm sure it's going to be kind of butchered up with the new movie, but, um, you know, I, I see such a different nose on Bill in Let It Be, like it's more like a Paul nose. And then you see him with the hook nose and many other, you know, photos or videos. So, you know, sometimes he has a hook nose, sometimes he has a straight nose like Paul. It's very, very odd unless it's different prosthetic noses, you know? Yeah, it, it could be prosthetics. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is still an enigma. But what I always tell people is that what we can be sure of is that the guy that's playing Paul McCartney today and has been playing the part as the primary replacement is not Paul McCartney. Nope. That's the thing we have to go back to. Sometimes people want to just nitpick it and say, what about this person? What about that? What about this image and that image? And so, oh, 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 oh. And they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's not productive. Yeah. It's unproductive because... What we're, we're getting away, we're drifting away from what we're supposed to be majoring in. And what we're majoring in is the guy today and the guy that has been with us publicly since the release of Sgt. Pepper is not biological Paul. No. And as I've mentioned, folks, doubles and lookalikes were used. And so many images have been doctored along the way as well. So combination of doctored images, images and photographs of doubles lookalikes along with the real deals and you know and what you have at the end of the day is a very very muddy bowl of soup yeah i mean every once in a while i'm thinking what what if he is still still alive and this is all for publicity i mean because that's what they said back in the day about the beatles doing it for publicity but then when you look at all like the almost forensic evidence of photos and everything else there's just too much, the heights, everything. You know, there's too, right. too much for him to be biological Paul. Ed Opperman asked me that question. I said, look, you can never say never. Right. Because at the end of the day, you really don't know for sure because everything we're looking at is circumstantial evidence. It's not direct evidence. Right. Right. Nobody's come forth and said, I saw him die. That's never happened. Nope. But what we don't see, and what, what, what I told Ed during the interview, is that I don't see any evidence 
that biological Paul McCartney has been with us since late 1966 forward. Let's just say from 1967, January 1st, 1967. We'll make it really easy. Yeah. Forward. And I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of images, and I don't see biological Paul. Agreed. So, you know, somebody could say, oh, well, he went into a witness protection program. That's possible. But again, you are surmising. You're fabricating a narrative. Right. You're rationalizing. The nuts and bolts of this thing is a psychological operation, Steve. Yeah. It's what the Beatles were used for to change the culture and the society. That is what I'm focused on. All this other stuff is sideshow stuff. It's sidebar stuff that it's just bantering back and forth and arguing and debating and throwing rocks at each other and all that stuff. I don't care about that stuff. What I care about is the psychological operation and how it was pulled off. That's what I think that we should be focused on, or at least that's what I'm focused on. Right. Okay, and we have more on the shepherd's crook. Here's a picture of one, Steve. It's got a kind of a fancy handle. Yep, and it's it's made out of ram's horn. I, I, I did as much research on this, and I, I was a little disappointed. I didn't find more than what I found. But, it, but it's, you know, it's a lot of these were made with a ram's horn, and there again, the ram for the ram album. And, you know, plus there was a sheep farm and there was rams up there. That little little hook on the top, I guess you could put a lantern on that. You know, I, I researched that. I didn't know why that kind of hooked up like that. But you could put a lantern on, so if you're out at night. But, you know, you can buy one of these these uh, shepherd's crooks in Oregon, in the States here. And I, also, they sell them in England, too. They're quite tall, so I guess they're a bear to ship. You can buy one for like $200 made out of ram's horn. I want to have one just for my office, you know, so <laughs> I'm wrapped up in, you know, and all the research I've done, and I'm probably going to buy one. So it's an interesting uh, looking thing with the ram's horn on the top. It's just the handle part that is. Yeah. And then we have a um, blurb that you found when Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. He found a crook and a flail, along with many other treasures. Only pharaohs and gods could carry these symbols of power. Carter knew from this discovery that he had found the tomb of a pharaoh. So the crook is symbolic of power. Yeah, which, uh, you know, it seems to me Billy's pretty powerful. And, uh, you know, with the Egypt station and all the different Egyptian things with Osiris, you know, it kind of all ties together with this crook, too. You know, it could be just for the sheep out there, too, because I guess, you know, the hook of the thing could actually pull a, a lamb back, you know, if it's getting out of line or something. But to me, it's more symbolic because that painting of Crowley had it in there, too. The same exact yeah, Rams. Yeah. So, you know, and I remember in the other video, you and I did a bunch with Osiris and, uh, you know, the different symbols. And Ralph had put up some different pictures of it. So, you know, seeing all this stuff about Osiris again was interesting, you know, to me with the crook. It goes on here to say that in honor of the god Osiris, the kings or the pharaohs of Egypt carried a crook and a flail, the sign of Osiris. The crook especially became the sign of rulers. The crook looked a great deal like a snake and was made out of wood. The ancient Egyptians used wood because wood was scarce. That made it even more special. Yep. Obviously, Billy's not carrying the shepherd's crook because he thinks goes well with his attire <laughs> yeah you know still has it but he made it pretty prominent in a lot of those old uh, things at the farm you know it was shown in a lot of photos yeah i'm going to read this one because this has some interesting wording yeah the crook as a symbol of power guardianship or prestige appears in both ancient and modern art and emblems the crook and the flail were two symbols associated with the ancient Egyptian god Osiris. Political and religious leaders from the pharaohs to Jesus to kings and popes have carried them to symbolize that they shepherded or led their people. Even today, high-ranking clergy of many denominations carry a crook or similar staff to show their responsibility for their flocks. Legend has it that the candy cane, shaped like a simple crook, got its start as long ago as 1670, when the choir master at the Cologne Cathedral handed out sugar sticks in the shape of a shepherd's crook among his young singers to keep them quiet during the long living crash or creche ceremony. Uh, so this is interesting to me, Steve, because they talk about that they shepherded or led their people. 
and what I was talking about before about Paulism being a religion. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. So what were the Beatles doing? Yeah. The Beatles had the shepherd's crook. Yeah. And they were herding the flock down a new path. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and so that leads us to this picture here, Steve. There's a, another uh, image you have of a crook. Yeah, I was trying to find as many as I could made out of ram's horn. So this is different than Billy's crook. Similar design. It doesn't have that little flip up for the lantern part, though. You know, the guy told me a lot of people request to have them made out of the ram's horn. Why? I don't know. I think that really ties in, though, to the ram album the whole bit. You know, to have it be made out of ram, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then we've got this image. Yeah. Now, a lady from our site, the, the Many Faces of uh, Billy Shepard, posted it up on the site. And the one on the left is Stan Shaw. And Ralph had done a morph of that, too, into Billy. But she posted this, and what I what I noticed is the feet. And I, I think when you were reviewing this, I think maybe you didn't see it, but I still see that his, what would be his right foot, I believe it is showing uh, six toes, and he's got his little pinky toe kind of tucked under the other toe. And it's the same in the other one, too, I think. Um, it shows the toes, I think, that, that six toes, you know, they always say six-toed belly. Yeah, I have another image of the one on the right. Yeah. And I think it has a, a better view. So yeah. maybe I'll slip that in there. And I don't know about the six toes on the stanchal piece of it. I know you're saying that maybe the six toe is tucked in. I will say that on his right foot, because his feet are crisscrossed, right. the small toe is extremely long. Yeah, it's just, you know, when I look at my own foot, I don't have that. My foot doesn't go right around the outside of if that was a small toe it doesn't go around the outside of it it kind of blends in it, it just is a very odd looking uh not putting billy down but just looking it, it's kind of a unique foot i think you know and also you know the stanchal image is mocking christianity yeah i mentioned earlier about the illuminati declaring war in 1962 on christianity yeah and the other thing I also want to mention, in all fairness, the image to the right of, quote-unquote, McCartney, I am not sure that that's not a double or a look-alike. Could be. This image, he really looks like a pretty boy. Yeah. In this one. And you can see how his chin is kind of squared off. And right. I don't know. There's something about that particular version of McCartney that uh, I always questioned. And also... This one had been doctored because, if I'm not mistaken, he actually had shorts on. Yeah, he does. I think it's just cut out there. Yeah, I, somebody decided that, you know, they wanted to stare at him partially naked. Some weirdo. Okay. I thought so, it was interesting to put the two next to each other, though. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's good to look at this stuff. It really is. And people, folks, you can draw your own conclusion. Right. We're not trying to steer you down a particular path. You know, look at this stuff, research it, investigate it, and come up with your own ideas and thoughts. Right. So then you have a blurb up here that says, this is Paul McCartney's standing stone situated in a small field just a few yards to the west of the house on his High Park estate in the Mall of Kintyre. It stands nine feet, six inches above the ground. So we have nine and six and nine plus six is 15 and one plus five is six. So we have all the occulted numbers in there again. And then we have, uh, again, an image of Billy in front of the stone. Yeah. And I didn't know this, Steve, but Martha, the dog, is buried there as well. Yes? Yep, next to her master, I believe. So that's what all these videos have been about, you know. I, I, I think, uh, like I said, I believe he inherited the dog from Paul when he died. It shows when, when she died there, I believe. I think the year it might have there. Yeah, it says she passed away at age 15, 1 plus 5 is 6. Right. In 1981 at High Park Farm. And Martha was born on June 16th, 1966, the day before McCartney purchased High Park. Okay, so he actually purchased the farm uh, near his birthday. Right. And this is something I didn't know either. You pointed this out when we spoke a couple of days ago. But if you invert Rubber Soul, you get Abbey Road, or what appears to be Abbey Road. You know, they talk about how the backwards talking and backwards writing, but... You know, you can kind of see the A, B, B, E, Y on the bottom. Yeah, that I see, yep. Also, I thought it was interesting, Rubber Soul, Abbey Road, you know, together. Yeah. And I can't take total credit for this because I, I believe somebody posted this on, on the site. Okay, yeah, no, no, that, this is good to have in there. People can stare at that as well. 
And then we have, uh, well, this is this picture is uh, shown a lot. And uh, I guess the reason why you showed it was because um, it ties into Billy's video. Who cares? But this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is Tara Brown's car, right? Or at least that's what we're told. And that's what I'm confused about. If it's Tara Brown's car, you know, the one in Who Cares, the video there. And I've seen that car depicted many times. Why is Bill driving Tara Brown's car, you know? <laughs> And then he's got the lady with the red hair in there. I forget the actress's name, but she's in, in the Who Cares video. And they're, they're being chased by a mob. So I still think, you know, he died Princess Diana style, Paul. I think he, I think he was being chased probably in another vehicle or something. And I, I believe he crashed because of that, you know. That's what I was told uh, a few years back. A source had reached out to me and said that uh, the car accident was actually engineered to happen. And that people that were responsible for forcing the car accident actually ensured that he was dead yeah. after the accident. This is what I was told. I mean, I, you know, I don't know yeah. how true it is, but I mean, it, it sounds like a, a possible scenario. Yeah. And it says in memoirs, he picked up Donna, I guess it was. It wasn't really. Donna, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think this actress, you know, even though she looks like Raggedy Ann a little bit, I think she was picked up, you know, the same way as this Donna was there shows are getting in the car they drive off so i believe he's depicting definitely the, the crash of uh, paul okay in the next picture we have uh sean lennon and you said that's his uh his girlfriend yeah his girlfriend and uh the reason i wanted to put that in a black and white sort of look of it and uh you know as you said sean with a witch's hat yep the witchcraft too what i thought was interesting is that her hair looks a lot like the character in who cares she, and she looks, you know, just has the same look in that photo to me. Yeah, I'll have to stare at this a little bit. Yeah. And then there's the number six on the bottom left. Yeah. And I would love to get a close up. I'll see if I can do it of the. Uh, yeah. What Sean is wearing, the necklace. Yeah, I wonder what that is, too. Yeah, I'm sure it has some occult meaning. Yep. I mean, it goes nice with his witch's hat. Yeah. All right, the next image, uh, I've seen this before, too. This is uh, like predictive programming. <laughs> Yeah, I never had seen that before, and it looks like he's dead, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arms, like, flailed over like he has no life to him, and Pete Best there. So this is back in the Hamburg days, right, I would think? Yep. You know, or the Cavern Club. Yeah, back in Hamburg and the Cavern, back in the 1960 yeah. to 62 period. Yeah. never saw that photo. I thought it was interesting, so I figured maybe a lot of viewers haven't seen that one. So. And then we got this image of uh, somebody on Billy's farm. I'm assuming it's his farm where they're shearing. Yeah, it's up at High Park. And uh, somebody tried to show me a picture of who they think that is. And I, I didn't think the guy looked like it at all. But this was a post from me on my site there. And I just happened to think that the guy on the right lower, because you, you were talking about doubles, yeah, awful lot like Bill. You know, I mean, to me, he does. He's got the hat on, so I can't really tell because of the hair. I still think he has a similar build to him and uh, the face and profile. I don't know what you think about it, but I'd never seen that before either. But he's sharing the sheep. I mean, he could just be a farmhand that kind of looks similar. Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I mean, I don't I don't see the similarity. If you blow that up, I probably should have done both blow ups of it, you know. And he has a hat on. Yeah, he's got like a um, one of those beanie hats, sort of. OK, it's hard to see here. OK. Otherwise, I was going to say, at the very least, they have the same hairstylist. <laughs> yeah. You blow it up, though, you can really kind of see it looks like Bill a little bit, you know. He doesn't have the beard, so there again, like you were saying about, you know, in that other picture, it kind of throws you off. I'm just thinking out loud sort of thing. That's how I found out a lot of things, by thinking like that, so. Well, like I said, we'll let the audience uh, take a look at it. They can decide for themselves. And then we have... Uh, this is his daughter's shop, right? Yeah, Stella McCartney, that black and white motif. And I read that it has stones from High Park Farm, you know. So this whole standing stone thing, to me, has a lot of prominence, you know. Yeah. Uh, I guess those are put in there as seats. It must be real heavy to put them in a store. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, though. Could be she just wants to reminisce about High Park in those days when she was raised up there. Um, but she's a big designer, as you know. And she does have the black and white thing going, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, a lot of black and white coats and black and white pocketbooks you can see in her store i think yeah or is in london it could be in new york city but i believe it's in london if i remember correctly but you know it had a whole blurb about it so i thought i'd throw it in there yep and then we've got oh billy's with the shepherd's crook once again yeah all right and then we get to uh some art yeah 
And uh, I was told that this painted by Billy was of David Bowie, but I don't really believe it is because when you see this, the drawing that John Lennon did, it has has the same kind of ripped head on the top, and it looks like he was somewhat decapitated. Not his whole head came off, but what these pictures are showing me, I think it shows that accident. And then the shovel planting the bulbs there. And as I told you, I, I never I never said this in the other video, but it's either a mushroom coming up under the dog or a tulip, I believe. It has a little bit of reddish color, though. Yeah. Under that dog there. And this was John Lennon's drawing. Yeah, John Lennon's drawing. And then uh, Bill's painting is the other one, and only in color, and it's even a little more grotesque, you know. That's sort of the clam eyes, which, you know, which that's more Billy with the hooded eyelids, I think, you know. I think they're very similar images, though. Do you think so or not? I, I see some similarity. I do. Yeah. It's interesting that, you know, Billy painted one and John drew the other. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then I'd love to find out what those symbols mean in Billy's painting. I need to research that more, but didn't have time really to get to it. I wanted to get this out. But they, I think those must mean something. They don't look like Japanese symbols. They, and I don't know if they're Egyptian, but they look like symbol of some kind. It's probably something Egyptian. <laughs> All right, so then you have um, an image leading to a burial chamber. Yeah, and this was this was another standing stone. So you know, I can't take credit for that being photographs of High Park Farm, but I've been speculating the whole time from these ancient Druid ruins under standing stones that that's what they have. They have chambers underneath that hill, probably. Similar to this. I don't I don't know where they're accessed from, whether it's from a trap door somewhere, um, but somehow you can get down into these chambers under the ground. And this was under a standing stone, not not Bill's. Kind of interesting. Very, very narrow, but all made out of stone. And there you can see a guy standing next to one of the pillars holding up the other stones underneath. Kind of ties into what we've been doing, that if Paul is down there, could be in one of the chambers down there, and it's reached by these tunnels. And then we got Paul McCartney and John Lennox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> presentation around here but you know i just like the show he, he was there at one time and uh it's almost the same angle i believe as bill's shown there you can kind of see i don't know what how, how tall are you john just a fraction under six foot oh under six foot and bill's six foot two we think right i pegged him at around six foot two i mean we're talking about when he's younger today because he's older he may have shrunk an inch or two so i, I say between six and six foot two yeah and he's a little more forward of the stone there too but he looks very tall a little bit taller than John, anyway. You know what's interesting about this picture, this image of him on the left, yeah. uh, Steve, is that I don't see any black hair on his arms or his legs. <laughs> yeah, it looks like he was shaving. And then we have this picture here before we wrap up, and I guess that's the stone back to our right, which would be off Billy's left shoulder. Yeah, I always thought that it was, but then I've seen some other photos where it shows. Yeah. And I don't believe it is the stone. Open I'd have some kind of reference to where that burn is and where that planting is. But we didn't find out. I mean, that was the whole point of going to the farm, unfortunately. But I still feel like he got, you know, some video of how desolate it is up there. So it wasn't all for nothing. And the fact that they locked up the gate that tightly kind of tells me they want to hide something up there, in my opinion. They don't want anybody else on that land again, ever. So I don't think so. I don't think we're ever getting up there again. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. And to be honest with you, after um, we did part two. Yeah. I thought that they were going to lock it up, to be honest with you, because um, no matter how many times we were adamant yeah. and emphatic about people not going there, you know yeah. there were going to be people that were going to try to go there. So it didn't surprise me that when you went to go there again, that it was locked up. Right. But good job. You know, I mean, really good work. And uh, the interesting thing is that um, Tom says that you're going to be or you're going to be referenced in a footnote in the update of memoirs. So that says to me that the work that you have done has importance one way or another. So you should feel really good about that, Steve. Yeah. And John and Ralph's not with us and Ralph as well. It's good work. It's great work because it's, you ventured into an area that really nobody else has that, that I'm aware of is with regard to the standing stone. Yeah. People have uh, tried to figure out where he's, he's buried. But before you guys came along, I did not hear that it was connected to a standing stone. Right. So uh, so you went into uh, an area of the research that uh, was uncharted waters as far as I'm concerned, and you did great work. 
Yeah, thank you. So, and we'll have to let, you know, the audience will have to decide for themselves. Yeah. We're not here trying to convince anybody of anything. We're just presenting research. Yeah. And if it resonates with you, fantastic. If it doesn't, that's fantastic too. Well, Steve and John, thank you so much for uh, for coming on. And uh, I'll try to have the show out as soon as I can. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, we will talk soon. And great job. Thank you.